Uh, so everything we've done today has been on the fly, but the Lord is good, right? Uh, we're good to, uh, to be able to gather and to worship. If you have your Bibles, look, me at, look with me in Psalm 120. And uh, I'm so glad to be back. A lot of you have asked the, how, how our vacation was and uh, if we're glad to be home. And the answer is that the, the trip was great. I am glad to be home. I still, my body's not sure what time it is yet. And I'm uh, still adjusting, but uh, I am so, so pleased to be home. And we live in the greatest place on earth. And uh, I'm glad to be back among uh, family and friends here with all of you. As we continue to make our way into the new year, I wonder if it's fair, Is t- today's the 8th of January, how are those New Year's resolutions going? <laughs> Didn't make any. And uh, still have time. Some of us have already uh, need to restart on our commitments for the new year. So I want us to think this morning about charting a new direction, having a new direction in our lives. Uh, doing a lot of thinking not long ago about how the world convinces us that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. And we assume that if anything can be done at all, it can be done quickly and efficiently, and you name it. You think about the way that we do things in this world today compared to the way that we did it 30, 40, 50 years ago. So much has changed. Paying bills, the way we do banking, the way we do shopping, even the way we view losing weight. We, we figure all of it can be done pretty quickly if uh, we just have the right method or the right products or know the right whatever it is to do. All of our lives can be efficient and relatively things can be done speedily done. What I've noticed is that as Americans especially, we, uh, we apply that to parts of our lives where it really shouldn't be applied. That expectation of expediency and convenience. So take for instance, religion has become this big business in the world. I don't know if you've noticed but there is a huge market for all manner of religious experience. I think people want to experience God and they want to have their lives changed and they expect it to happen quickly and efficiently, preferably on a Sunday morning before noon. (laughs) Right? And there is little enthusiasm in our world today for the day-to-day work of following Jesus year after year. Yeah, did you feel that? All right, so, you know, I'm a pastor. I've been doing this a long time. I've been your pastor for a long time. Let me tell you the truth. I'm convinced that people expect things to be easy and efficient and convenient. And in this community, in this church, at this point in our lives, uh, with everything we've gone through for the past few years, there is very little enthusiasm for long commitments and week-to-week work. That's right. And so we struggle with this, what I'm calling a tourist mindset. I just spent two weeks in Europe as a tourist. Let me be honest, I wasn't always the, uh, the best <laughs> tourist. I wanted everything to be easy, I wanted it to be convenient, and I wanted it to be pleasant. Frankly, we had plans things to do, and things to see, a tight schedule to keep, and when things did not go as I wanted, I got irritated. <laughs> and I found myself thinking, hey, I'm on vacation here. And not only that, I'm an American. <laughs> right? Everything needs to You owe it to me to make this experience as good for me as you possibly can. And I come here on Sunday mornings and I hear people telling me the same thing about church. And I wonder, have we become tourists in the life of faith? And the people in Aransas County are in a hurry. I know we're all incredibly busy. 
We want shortcuts. We want a quick fix. We get impatient for results. We want only the highlights. We don't have the time or the energy for long commitments and tedious work week after week after week. The Christian author and pastor, uh, Eugene Peterson, before he passed away, says that the Bible calls us to be disciples and pilgrims, not tourists. Disciples are people who spend their lives apprenticed to the Master, Jesus Christ. We live and we learn from Him. Discipleship is not done quickly. It's not done in classrooms on Sunday morning. It takes a long time. We're also pilgrims. We are people who spend our lives going someplace, going to God, and whose path for getting there is the way Jesus Christ. Pilgrims are on a journey. And as we make our way on our journey of faith, we need to keep in mind that the journey is a long one, and we learn only as we go along. And that journey and that learning takes time. It takes effort. There is success. There is failure. There is learning in the both. And we are shaped by the experience. The good news is that on the journey, our master walks with us. And we walk with each other. And we are going somewhere. We are going to God. We are drawing or we are traveling closer to the presence of God. And one day we'll reach the end of that journey where we will be in the presence of God forever. Now, every journey must begin somewhere. And just where does one begin a journey of faith into the presence of God through a life of discipleship to Jesus Christ? So this morning, I suggest we consider learning from Psalm 120 how to begin. Psalm 120 is the first psalm of the Psalms of Ascent. That section of the Hebrew Psalter that were likely the songs sung by the Hebrew pilgrims as they went up to Jerusalem to the great worship festival several times a year. The journey to worship was ascending. You went up to the temple to worship. It was sometimes hard. It could be dangerous for these pilgrims. And we know that Jesus Christ himself made this pilgrimage in his life, probably often. So these may be the very songs that he sang along the way. Psalm 120 is the first one. It's a song of repentance. It's a song at, that's sung as an expression of the pilgrim's dissatisfaction with the world as it is, coupled with a longing for peace and truth. It reflects the pilgrim's determination to set a new direction. So let's read Psalm 120. I'll start in verse 1. I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. Save me, O Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you? And what more besides, O deceitful tongue? He will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom tree. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am a man of peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, there's a couple of things that we can see from the psalm that are very applicable to our journey of faith. Here's the first thing I want you to see. That my journey of faith begins when the status quo is unacceptable. My journey of faith begins when the status quo is unacceptable. So, in other words, a person must be thoroughly disgusted with the way things are to find the motivation to set out on the Christian way. You must be absolutely convinced that I cannot live like this any longer in order to follow Christ. Because the Christian way is not an easy way. And so you have to be convinced it's the right way before you set out on it. 
I'll be willing to risk living a life of faith as long I will be unwilling to risk living a life of faith as long as I think things aren't so bad or if I think salvation or solutions will come to me from another source apart from Christ. A person has to be fed up with the ways and the answers of the world before he or she acquires an appetite for the kingdom of God. In the psalm, we see that the status quo is unacceptable for a variety of reasons. So we see that the status quo becomes unacceptable to the psalmist because of deceit and conflict in his life and relationships. The people around the psalmist and the situation itself are all deceptive. So a journey of faith begins when I can no longer avoid the reality that I have been deceived and that I'm also deceiving others. I try to tell myself, and I want everybody around me to think that everybody's, everything's fine, and it's great, and I'm so thankful for social media because it allows me to live with the facade that I live this perfect life, perfect, beautiful, wonderful, and everything's just fine. And when we gather together like this on Sunday mornings, there's this grand masquerade that takes place. How you doing? What's the answer to that question? Fine, I'm great. If it was any better, it would take me days to tell you. And sometimes the truth is just the opposite. See, we, we are practiced in the art of deception. Misdirection. The truth is things may not be alright as they are. And they may not be getting any better. A little boy was lost during the Christmas shopping rush and he was standing in an aisle of the busy department store crying, I want my mommy. And people kept passing by giving the unhappy youngster nickels and dimes. And finally a floor walker came over to him and said, I know where your mommy is, son. And the little boy looked up with his tear-drenched eyes and said, so do I. Just keep quiet. <laughs> But everything is always as it seems. So what's the truth if we live in the midst of so much deception? Here's the truth. New life in Jesus Christ is possible, but I must want it more than I want what I have apart from Christ. I must want it more than what I have apart from Christ. See, in the psalm, God's name appears only twice, but it is used as a kind of protection against deception. God is a refuge from all the lies and the liars. God exposes the lies. God reveals the truth. So the psalmist cries out, you know, Lord, deliver me from the liars and the deceivers who are so prominent in this world. Save me from all the ways that I deceive myself. The truth is, is what I'm supposed to be about. So what's the truth? The truth about me is that God made me and God loves me. The truth about the people who surround me at any given time is that God made them and God loves them. The truth about our world is that God made it and provides for it. The truth about what is wrong with this world is that I and my neighbor sitting beside me have sinned. And the truth is that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross for our sins. And he was raised from the dead for our salvation. Amen. And the truth is that we can participate in new life as we believe in Christ, accept his mercy, respond to his love, and obey his commands. That's the truth. Something else we see is that the status quo becomes unacceptable when I long for peace rather than the deceit and conflict around me and within me. The psalmist speaks of being a man of peace while everybody around him desires war and conflict. That word for peace is shalom. It's the total well-being or the prosperity and security associated with God's presence among his people. It has the idea of rest. You can be at rest. You are safe. You are secure. You experience peace in the presence of God. But the pilgrim says, I am for peace. But the pilgrim's distress comes from 
having to live without shalom. There is conflict around me. There is conflict within me. I'm not at peace. I'm not at rest. I'm disturbed. I'm discontent. And I believe that this place and these people uh, are, are, are part of the problem. And I am part of the problem. And I know that in order to experience peace, I need to leave here and go to the presence of God. Go to Jerusalem as a pilgrim. And I hope that these people will come with me. But I, whether they go or not, I must go to the presence of the Lord. So here's the question. You know, what is the truth about me and my life and the people around me? Has the time come to accept the truth about the life that I'm living and then to set out for the peace, the shalom that comes only with the presence of the Lord? Am I convinced that everything is fine? Or have I, be, have I come to see that something needs to change? I, I feel it. I sense it. I see it. The status quo is no longer sufficient. Am I ready for something different? Which leads us to the second thing we see in the psalm. My journey of faith begins when I willingly turn away from my old life and pursue a path that leads to God through Jesus Christ. See, the psalm has this fork in the road, and I've arrived, and I need to make a decision. Psalm 20 marks a transition from living in the lives of this world to making a pilgrimage into the presence of God. And so the psalmist says, for too long I've lived in this way, in this people, in this place among these people. He describes Meshech, a, a far off tribe, thousands of miles from Palestine in southern Russia. He describes Kedar, a wandering Bedouin tribe of barbaric reputation along Israel's borders. Together they represent the strange, the hostile people in places that are far from the presence of God. And so the psalmist is saying, we are far from God, but I am determined to go to God. Who will go with me? And I need to leave behind these places and these people if they will not come with me into the presence of God, because I must go. Amen. And this is, this is repentance. Repentance is a complete change of orientation involving a judgment upon the past and a deliberate redirection for the future. It's a change in the whole personality from a sinful course of action and turning towards God instead. It's saying no to the deceptions of myself and the world in which I live and saying yes to the reality of God. Man. I'm not going to live this way any longer. I make a choice. I exercise my will and then I set out for the presence of God. I want you to know that repentance is not an emotion. It is not feeling sorry for my sins. It is a decision that I make. I believe that. It's an act of will. It is deciding that I have been wrong and supposing I could manage my own life and be my own God. Repentance is deciding that I was wrong in thinking that I had or could get the strength, the education, and the training to make it on my own. Repentance is deciding that I have been told a pack of lies about myself and my neighbors and my world. Repentance is deciding that God and Jesus Christ is telling me the truth. And so repentance is the realization that what God wants from me and what I want from God is not going to be achieved by doing the same old thing. Thinking the same old thoughts. Repentance is a decision to follow Christ and become his pilgrim in the path of peace. But I'm not naive. And so I know what I'm saying is a real challenge. Whenever I say no to one way of life that is comfortable and familiar, there is fear and possibly grief over what I might lose. 
It is easier to remain in the status quo even when that reality is harmful. But the psalmist indicates that the sooner I depart, the better. Researchers describe in psychology what is called a status quo bias. And we're all familiar with this. It's, it's an emotional bias, a preference for the maintenance of one's current or previous state affairs, or a preference to not undertake any action to change this current or previous state. So in other words, every one of us have this emotional connection to our current status quo, the current state of affairs. And there's this a certain level of anxiety related to thinking about changing the current state of affairs. So researchers have, found, researchers have found that the status quo bias combines with what is called loss aversion. And the result is that I am more likely to regret trying something new than I am to regret sticking with what I know, even if I'm actually missing out on something better. There is a bias towards the familiar. Now, think with me. Most of us like to think of ourselves as daring adventurers who embrace change and new paths and new experiences. But what's the truth? Our daily routines reveal the truth. What happens when your daily routine is disrupted? Be honest. And, and, and I know very well how this church handles when we change the Sunday morning schedule. <laughs> it's not pretty. We like our routines. We don't like new. We like what we know, what we're familiar with, what's comfortable. We don't like it to be disrupted. Let me ask you, what is the most popular ice cream flavor in the world? It's vanilla. Vanilla. When my family was in London, we went to a shop in Chinatown called Chin Chin, and it sold nitro ice cream. So when you ordered it, they mixed up the ingredients right in front of you, and then they froze it with liquid nitrogen. So the ice cream was done on the spot. It didn't sit around all day in some deep freezer. It was made fresh to order. And they had all these fabulous, unusual flavors to try. And it just was amazing to see all the things that they could do with ice cream. So I ordered some chocolate chip cookie dough that was warmed up in a skillet, and then I got to choose what ice cream went on top of that, this huge menu. And you know what ice cream flavor I ordered? No. no. <laughs> Vanilla bean. <laughs> In this status quo bias, this is why we order the same thing at restaurants. See, I'm more afraid of trying something new and not liking it than I am of sticking with my favorite and possibly missing out on something better. We stick with the sure thing, what we know. It's how we get that phrase, better the devil you know, right? And what the psalmist says is that even though we are like this, God's not content to let us stay in our fearful, emotional ruts. And so God sends His arrows and His judgment aimed at provoking repentance. God acts to move me out of my rut. And, and so the psalmist says, you, you can expect deceitful tongue, that God's not going to be content to let you stay deceitful. And so God's going to send His arrows that are meant to move you out of the path of deception into the truth. Any hurt is worth it that puts me on the path of peace, setting me free for the pursuit of eternal life in Christ. And here's what I'm telling you. There is a way out of distress, discontent, dissatisfaction, and disquiet. And that way begins in repentance, turning to and following Jesus. And I would suggest that the best thing for some of us right here in this room to do today is repent. 
to make a transition, to start out in a new direction, to move out of that rut, that fearful, emotional place that's kept us stuck and to go in a new direction. So today, the time has come for you to decide. Christ called his disciples to leave all things behind and to follow him. The only question that remains now is whether or not you will answer the call of the Lord. I wonder today, could you pray with me a prayer like this? Lord, I'm convinced that you and your ways are right. And that apart from you, my life loses its meaning. Show me in my life, in this situation, with these people, how do I turn to you and start a new direction? There might be all manner of things in your life and in your circumstances and in your relationships that need to change. But what if what needs to change is you? And what if Christ has exactly in mind the transitions he wants to make in your life so that you could be less like yourself or the world around you and more like him? A new direction. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to this time of commitment, of decision, I pray that you would speak truth into our lives in a way that we hear and understand, can comprehend, and know how to respond. Tell me the truth about myself. Tell me the truth about my life, my circumstances, my desires. Tell me the truth about my relationships, my priorities, my, my agendas. All of it, Lord, lay me bare before you. And then, Lord, show me a new direction. What does repentance look like for me right here with these people at this time? How do I need to be made new? And Lord, I pray that in the hearts of the people who are worshiping you today, that you would stir up hope that in Christ changes are possible. We don't have to be stuck where we are. There can be a new direction. And I pray that you would give us the courage to take hold of Christ. To turn from one way of living. And embrace uh, Christ's way of living. Amen. And I ask, Lord, that your will would be accomplished in the lives of those here today. And those who are watching online. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.